Welcome back to the Value Investors Club. Welcome back to VIC Readings. I'm your host, Timon Vonnelich. Let's get right into it with Omni Bridgeway. Filed in on September 15 by DR1004. Price at that point was $3.70. A share a description. Thesis. Below 10x PE. Acceleration in cash flow near term. Strong growth and non-cyclical. The catch, OBL is a complex litigation asset manager, with, which in recent years has not shown either consistently positive earnings or excess cash flow. This is due to the lags before receiving returns inherent in the business and further lags caused by the waterfall nature of the legacy investment fund. The lack of earnings and cash flow will be fixed as their legacy funds run off generating near-term earnings and ca slash cash and subsequently as their new funds ramp and the business matures closer to steady-state profitability. If the low valuation persists despite the earnings and cash flow improvement, then OBL will use a newly authorized buyback program to help reduce the discount. Business Summary OBL finances litigation. The core of the business is funding individual cases, where OBL will pay the legal costs of the suit and in return receive a portion of the win. Effectively, they allow lawyers, the main sales channel in litigation finance, to offer clients the option of no win, no fee on large cases with no risk to the law firm. The industry has been consistently growing as more lawyers and clients can become familiar and comfortable with the arrangement. OBL was written up in June 2020 and Pierre Burford has been written up four times. Therefore, I will not go into detail on the background and the history of litigation finance, but will highlight a couple of recent factors which have been significant drag, have been a significant drag for OBL but are now improved. COVID had a slowing return, a slowing effect on the courts and the progress of cases. This has also temporarily hurt the flow of new cases as some potential pain plaintiffs were put off by the lengthened and costly timelines to progress cases. The overall impact was weaker growth over the past two years in both new commitments, deals and case completions, hurting profits and cash flow. Competition ramped up rapidly pre-COVID with many fundraisers across the industry, but now appears to have moderated as less established funders do not yet have recycled capital to deploy or realize returns to show investors. The impact of the previous ramp in competition was primarily, uh, primary, primarily on slowing new business growth with less damage to pricing. This is hard to observe from the outside, but is supported by expert and peer commentary. Management track, management's track record is good, and they have grown the business while maintaining strong investment returns. They appear well aligned with shareholders, have bought shares in the past, and are thoughtful on capital allocation. They are also notably more modestly paid <coughs> than Burford executives. Although I have found them to have high integrity and to aim uh, foreign transparency. The CEO does have a tendency to set guidance and goals as aspirational targets rather than conservative bar to be met in most circumstances. This has led to an under-delivery on growth, which is the main black mark against an otherwise strong team. Valuation. While OBL now has eight funds, uh, the core go-forward business model used by OBL is large funds four and five. Currently, uh, half a billion capacity each, but likely to be upsized in fiscal year 2023 to one billion dollars each. These provide number one a management fee of just under two percent on capital deployed. Number two performance fees of twenty to thirty percent based on the level of IRR, which are paid on an ongoing basis, recalculated deal by deal. OBL also co-invests twenty percent into these funds. While I model the business fund, uh, the business fund by fund, a simplified approach to estimating earnings power in fiscal year 2025 June end is to assume a level of deployed capital in funds four and five, an IRR, a corporate costs, and a level of ongoing earnings with other smaller specialty funds, including fund six and above, 
plus some small long-tail earnings from legacy funds. Of these, the most important swing variables are growth, capital deployment and IRR. As mentioned above, growth has recently been slowed by COVID and competition. Paired with management over optimism, uh, this resulted in slower growth in fiscal year 2022 than guided. New commitments grew 12% in fiscal year 2022 and only 1% per employee. This appears to have turned a corner, a corner with a strong finish to fiscal year 2022 new commitments. Also, the COVID and competition issues are fading. Additionally, since April 2021, OBL have been transitioning their organization to be more US-centric. CEO moved to New York City from Australia and a new CFO competition uh, was hired. And have made investments in staffing here uh, there. And this ramp up should also help growth in fiscal year 2023. They guide uh, plus 25% commitment growth in FY 2023, uh, C plus 15% per employee, which I think is broadly reasonable. Although their long term of FY 2025 uh, guidance is now unlikely to be met without, any, without, without an acquisition. I model a relatively fast fade in growth rate even as they continue to improve productivity with increased employee tenure and increased focus on larger size deals. A modest size acquisition, likely cash debt funded, is likely at some point and would lift growth but leave less room for repurchases. They have a strong track record on integrating acquisitions and this likely nets out for our EPS or is slightly accredited. While the three-year trailing IRR is 39% and historically has been higher, I assume C30% going forward with slightly higher returns in the non-US funds and lower in the US funds where there is more competition. Management targets 30% minimum um, when underwriting deals. C30% IRR is also consistent with Burford, who, an, who on average have a greater share of lower, of lower return and lower risk portfolio deals. It is worth noting that while these IRRs appear unsustainable high relative to asset management, private equity or most speciality finance, the IRR is far less generous when accounting for the high operating costs as a percentage of invested capital needed to evaluate yields successfully, likely to remain above 5% for the foreseeable future despite scale improvements and in prior years has been above 10%. I estimate an fiscal year 25 EPS of A39 uh, cents and a net cash position after modest buybacks at 15x in line with good quality speciality finance asset management. This would be a this would be a $5.85 and a 58% return in two years. When investors look to fiscal year 2025, 15x may be conservative given given I expected underlying growth and new commitments to be 10% plus, 10 plus and invest in capital to be grown 20% plus, given growth lags. Additionally, while most speciality financials and asset managers struggle to trade above 15x, they are generally highly cyclical. While litigation finance is more or less non-cyclical, a potential minor defendant ability to pay issues in a downturn balance by the new business benefits of more insolvency-related claims and greater desire to OBL's capital provision by plaintiffs, in a reasonable upside case of 37% IRRs, 45% ex-US and 30% US, closer to their historical track record and targets, and 17.5x PE, the shares would return plus 130% to A, $8.50. In the meantime, over the next two years, OBL will see most of the lucrative tail end of their legacy funds, one to three, and some more minor returns from corporate balance sheets investment. Funds one to three were structured as European waterfalls, with the result being that until this year, the vast majority of cash flows and profits have occurred to the investors. Now, with these almost paid back, the dynamic will likely switch to over 80% paid to OBL likely at some point in FY23. 
Management provides specific estimates of the cash realization they expect from their committed business, which, although clearly suspect to high uncertainty, have in the past been accurate about quantity on average, with some over-optimism on speed of resolution. These estimates point to CA 430 million of cash to OBL pre-tax over the next two years from these legacy investments after minorities. In the context of the other funds and corporate expenses, this should drive bumper EPS. I estimate A 40 cents to 50 cents across FY2324, even considering the high uncertainty and lumpiness inherent to the business. These years are very likely to provide strong cash flows, cash flow, cash flows which cannot, can be used for buybacks and or acquisitions. In other words, investors do not have to wait for the core business to ramp up to see strong earnings and cash flows. I think this helps de-risk the investment case and potentially pulls forward realization for the valuation upside. Risks. Increased in industry competition and lower returns, either through pricing or taking on worse cases in the key risk for OBL, in my opinion. Currently, this risk appears to be receding with less money raised in the past year to focus on litigation finance and the return are far less egregious than they seem once fully costed with OPEX. The proportion of cases they fund versus deals they see has also not risen, which is encouraging. Increased competition from law firms taking more risk on themselves and other in a, is another area to watch as they take learnings from the litigation finance industry and develop their cap ability fund. Ability to fund. So far, it appears that increased focus on law firms, self-funding has become hand in hand with increased awareness of the benefits of litigation finance, which is logical given. They are two sides of the same coin, and large law firms will often use both. Regulatory risks. Generally, regulation has been on an improving or neutral trend with regards to litigation finance, but there is a persistent risk of tightening either the percentage of a case that can be earned or the type of case it, cases it can be used in. OBL's geographical diversification mitigates this to an extent. Catalyst. If the valuation discount remains, I expect management to execute on their recently announced A50 million buyback program over the next year and will increase the authorization in FY24 alongside strong cash flows. Achieving the transition from the legacy funds to be ramped to the ramped up funds 4 and 5 should improve visibility of the growth and allow for a more steady base of earnings from FY25. This should <coughs> I'm sorry. This should lead uh, steadily become more clear in the coming two years. There's upside to our and consensus numbers of F for FY24. If management surprisingly bullish expectations for current fund four and five investments play out over CY24. I only assume 30% IRR, while their estimates imply far higher returns, 50% plus. On their current book of investments, with much of this expected to be realized in FY24. Only a small slice of the equity market is truly non-cyclical, and a weak macro backdrop should help focus attention on OBL. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is not advice. See you next.